Yato Niviad Itaradas Charti Suavigya Swara Tene Brahma Hirdaya Adikavaye Muyantiyat Surayaha Tejo Varimedam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Trisargo Misha Dham Nasrina Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Di Mahi O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva, O oh, all pervading personality of Godhead, I, from my respectful base, this not to you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pujita Kaitrovatra Paramo Nirmatsananam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam tapatrayon muvanam. Shivadam Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Kimva Parir Ishwaraha. Sadyohide Avarudyate Tra. Krite Bihi Sususu Bistakshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavat the Purana propounds the highest truth which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kapatura galitam falam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Pivata bhagatam rasam alayam. Muhur ahoraska bhuvibhavu kaha. O expert and thoughtful man, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The, the, uh, the, the mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Shri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna 
Punya Shravana Kirtana Vedyantakstu Padrani Vidunati Suhit Satam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita it is, uh, is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu badresu nityam bhagavata sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloki Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about uh, Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajastamo Bhavo Kamalo Bhadayashaye Chete Etara Navidam Stefan Satve Prasedati By development of devotional service one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasanama so Bhagavat bhakti yogataha Bhagavat tattva vijnanam Mukta sangha sijayate When these impurities are wiped away the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasam saya siyante jasyakarmani trista evatmanishwari Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding the uh, understanding of the supreme personality of Godhead, a supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. <laughs> Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto One, Chapter Fifteen, Verse Twenty Seven. Again, we'll finish the purport today. Desa kalata yuktani Vita popa samanija Vita popa samanija Harantis maratas chitam Harantis maratas chitam Govinda bi hitani me So we're continuing the second paragraph and uh Well, no, we can, we're doing the third paragraph. The faithful human being who is desirous of being liberated from the clutches of material existence can very easily take advantage of the Bhagavad Gita. And with this in view, the Lord instructed Arjuna as if Arjuna were in need of it. In the Bhagavad Gita, five important factors of knowledge have been delineated pertaining to one, the Supreme Lord, two, the living being, three, nature, four, time and space, and five, the process of ag activity. Out of these, the Supreme Lord and the living being are qualitatively one. The difference between the two has been analyzed as the difference between the whole and the part and parcel. Nature is inert, matter, displaying the interaction of three different modes and eternal time and unlimited space are considered to be beyond the existence 
of the material nature. Activities of the living being are different varieties of aptitudes which can entrap or liberate the living being within and without material nature. All these subject matters are concisely discussed in the Bhagavad Gita and later the subject matters are elaborated in the Srimad Bhagavatam for further enlightenment. Out of the five subjects, the Supreme Lord, the living entity, nature, time, and space are eternal, but the living entity, nature, and time are under the direction of the Supreme Lord, who is absolute and completely independent of any other control. The Supreme Lord is the Supreme Controller, the material activity of the living being is beginningless, but it can be rectified by transferal into the spiritual quality. Thus, it can cease its material qualitative reactions. Both the Lord and the living entity are cognizant, and both have the sense of identification, of being conscious as a living force. But the living being, under the condition of material nature, called Mahatattva, misidentifies himself as being different from the Lord. The whole scheme of Vedic wisdom is targeted to the aim of eradicating such a misconception and thus liberating the living being from the illusion of material identification. When such an illusion is eradicated by knowledge and renunciation, the living beings are responsible actors and enjoyers also. The sense of enjoyment in this Lord is real, but such a sense in living being is a sort of wishful desire only. This difference in consciousness is a distinction of the two identities, namely the Lord and the living being. Otherwise, there's no difference between the Lord and the living being. The living being is therefore eternally one and different simultaneously. The whole instruction of the Bhagavad Gita stands on this principle. So there are a lot of points here. I'll try and discuss a few of them at least. First of all, the sense of enjoyment in the Lord is real, but such a sense in the living being is a sort of wishful desire only. So this is a very important point because we think that the sense of enjoyment in our mind is real but it's not because there's no possibility of enjoying in the material world. That is not real enjoyment. The only enjoyment we actually feel in the material world is relief from suffering. So that's not really positive. Uh, it's just like when a person uh, has to work really hard all day long to earn money. And then at night, they might uh, take some intoxication, watch television, eat some meat, and then have some sex and go to sleep. So, the watching television, the eating meat, and uh, uh, engaging in uh, sex and all these things, it's the temporary relief from suffering. It's not actually real pleasure. One may perceive it as pleasure, but it is not. Now, how do we know that? People will say, no, 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 this is real pleasure. This is the only pleasure I have in life. It's eating the meat and uh, taking some intoxication and having sex, and so forth. Well, in order to do that, they had to work very hard. Even the thief has to work hard, you say. So, uh, and and person gets tired, and they don't really even want to go uh, work. Uh, but they're forced to, in order to have money, in order to eat, sleep, mate, and defend. So, Real happiness, real pleasure, is enjoying with the Lord because it's eternal. And all this 
so-called temporary happiness is simply relief, a little bit of relief from suffering. So therefore it says, but such a sense in the living being is a sort of wishful desire only. Yes, because without being eternal, whatever little bit of happiness we, re we experience is temporary, transitory, and causes an anxiety because as soon as that little bit of happiness is over, again we're desiring, oh, I wish this could continue, but it can't. So that's an important point. And this, Prabhupada says, this difference in consciousness is the distinction of the two identities, namely the Lord and the living being. So this difference is consciousness, it is, it's the desire to enjoy is just a wishful desire only, whereas in the Lord it's real. And secondly, It says, the material activity of the living being is beginningless, but it can be rectified by transfer into the spiritual quality. So this is an important point also because, thank God that the law of karma is not eternal. If it was, we would have no way of getting out of the entanglement that we're in. But uh, at any point, if the living entity decides to surrender to the Lord, immediately the chains of karma can be revealed, uh, re relieved, and one can engage in transcendental activity of devotional service. So we discussed this yesterday. The, the, you asked the question. Remember your question yesterday? What is it all pointing to? What is what's the whole the whole message of Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, for? Right. So, yes. right. So, in two places, and more than two, but uh, two main places, this uh, point is made. So, when Krishna says, Taibhi ye sagunamai, mama maya duratyaya, mame ye papadyante. Mayam etam tarantite. So he says, in seventh chapter, fourteenth verse. He says, "This divine energy of mine." So right away, he's talking about uh, consisting of the three modes of nature. He's talking about the material nature, which is divine. That means, because it is eternal, because it's Krishna's inferior spiritual energy it's not a it's not really uh, what you would call uh, matter in the gross sense as being not material not spiritual it is spiritual therefore it's impossible to overcome it no matter how smart the scientists are and no matter how much they study and how many experiments they make and how many so-called inventions they make, it's impossible to overcome. So unless we realize that, we will attempt to overcome it. In fact, if you look up on the internet, purpose of science, let's see what it says, the purpose of modern science. You'll see that their purpose is to overcome the imperfections of material nature. They actually use that word imperfections or the shortcomings of material nature. Do you see anything? What's it say? Any casual what? R E C reckoning. And then, in other words, reckoning means any way you think about something. Wow. 
wow. He's being truthful. Yeah, send that to me. That's interesting. But uh, does it say what the purpose is of science? Yeah, well, he didn't ask, answer that question. He just said, yeah, it's controversial. Science is giving, giving good things and bad things, and you're not sure what the end result will be. We know what the end result is. It's going to be all bad. Does this say anything else? Anyway, the point is that through science, people want to correct what they think or, or improve what they think are imperfections in nature. So they're trying to overcome uh, nature's, let's say, uh, negative effects, such as, you know, extreme cold, extreme heat. So for extreme heat, they have air conditioning. In extreme cold, they have heating. And then uh, for uh, flooding, they, they have dikes. And, and for uh, uh, diseases, they have allopathic medicines and, uh, or surgeries. And uh, so in this way, they're trying to improve what they consider are imperfections or shortcomings or uh, negative effects of nature. Now, why are there negative effects in nature? Well, if you read carefully the uh, Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Ishopanishad, you'll see it's due to the sinful activities of living entities. God does not want people to suffer. Krishna does not want people to suffer. But suffering is caused by disobeying Krishna's instructions. And there's a very nice uh, point made in the uh, Ishopanishad, which talks about how the uh, how one can pacify nature. This is uh, mantra 14, which says, yes, sambutim vaktsha vinas samcha, yes, tat veda bayam saha vinas sena mirtam titva sambutam yatam asnate. So it says, once you know perfectly the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, and his transcendental name, form, qualities, and pastimes, as well as the temporary material creation with his temporary demigods, men, animals, and animals. When one knows these, he surpasses death and the ephemeral cosmic manifestation with it. And in the eternal kingdom of God, he enjoys his eternal life of bliss and knowledge. In other words, you're not going to have an eternal life of bliss and knowledge in the material world. In fact, you don't even have positive happiness. It's sim as we said, it's simply the temporary relief from suffering. So now in the purport, to this 14th mantra, uh, Prabhupada says, he's talking about the materials. They start varieties of public and semi-governmental institutions to tackle the devastating power of nature. That's it right there. That's the purpose of science, to tackle the devastating power of nature. But they don't know how to pacify insurmountable nature. Many men are advertised as great scholars of the Bhagavad Gita, but they overlook the Gita's message by which material nature can be pacified. You see, that's the whole point. They're trying to do it in the wrong way. And you'll see this is a fact in many, many things that the scientists do, like for example, there have, they have been collecting money and researching how to solve the problem of cancer since the 1920s. Especially, you got really uh, very intense, you know, in the 40s, the 50s, 
60s, the 70s, the 80s, because so many people are dying of cancer. Now, their approach to solving the problem of cancer is through genetic engineering. They think that cancer is something that's genetically passed from one uh, generation to another. And therefore, they're trying to figure out how to manipulate the genes of a person or the genetic information of a person to avoid or heal cancer. That is impossible. Whereas, it's not difficult to heal cancer. It's actually, uh, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's not difficult to can't heal it because it's caused by toxic buildup in the body by being in contact with many inorganic chemicals, and many of them are poisonous. And so in, in, if, you, if you ever read that, the article I wrote about five steps to optimal health, point three, I point out all toxic things in a modern house or in a building, any modern building. Now you'd be shocked at the number of toxic things that are in a house, a normal house. And uh, by being in, in contact with those things, eventually there's a cumulative effect of toxins entering into the body and that causes cancer. Uh, this was a, a theory that was proven true by a German uh, Nobel Prize winner called uh, Warburg, and uh, he was uh, he was not the direct doctor of of uh, Hitler, but he indirectly, although he was half Jewish, uh, he was spared being killed by uh, uh, Goebbels and uh, and Hitler because he was such a great scientist, you know. So here we see that the scientists are trying to heal this terrible thing called cancer, but the avenue that they're taking will not lead them to healing it. It's impossible. Right? Their whole analysis of the cause of it is wrong. So, and again, here we have another example. They're trying to do what? Uh, it says, many men are advertised as great scholars of the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, and it says, uh, they, meaning the materialists, start varieties of public and semi-governmental institutions to tackle the devastating power of nature. That is the purpose of science, to, to uh, tackle or to uh, overcome the devastating power of nature. And Prabhupada says, but they don't know how to pacify insurmountable nature. Many men are advertised as great scholars of the Bhagavad Gita, but they overlook the Bhagavad Gita's message by which material nature can be pacified. Powerful nature can be pacified only by the awakening of God consciousness, as clearly pointed out in the Bhagavad Gita 7.14, which is what I was talking about. So you see, this is a major theme of the Bhagavad Gita. This is the major purpose of modern science. And they're, look, they're trying to solve it in a way that's, that will never succeed whereas the way to succeed has been given in the Bhagavad Gita, but they won't pay attention to it. And we see every day there's insurmountable effects of nature. There's, there are forest fires in California. They're devastating. There are environmental contamination, devastating. There are floods that are devastating. There are hurricanes that are devastating. There are earthquakes that are devastating. There's volcanic eruptions that are devastating. There are tsunamis that are devastating, and so forth. And when these things happen, the army can't stop it. America has the strongest army in the world. It cannot stop a hurricane. They, can't, they just sit there and, and suffer, you know, uh, incapacitated. So this is an interesting point that we should think about s some more. Uh, it says the material activity of living entity is beginningless, but it can be rectified by transferal into the spiritual quality. 
Thus, it can cease its material qualitative reactions. That's the point, the material qualitative reactions. Okay, so we'll stop right there. Are there any questions? You see, there's a lot of big points in this purport. I haven't even covered a few of them. Yeah. So basically, the the the, uh, the idea of the science, they trying to solve the problems of life. Yeah. Well, the problems are birth old age, disease, and death, right? They consider all these things, and then, you know, heat, cold, uh, earthquakes, all this, and they consider all these things defects of nature. But they don't even know that. They don't, they don't know birth is suffering. At least they uh, have you ever seen a baby that's uh, laughing when it's born? They celebrate birthdays. I know. Any, any same person would say, well, why should I celebrate birthday? Mm. If I came to suffer, I was, when I was born, I was crying, Yes, yes, ignorance of many facts. The Prabhupada says, from birth one begins to die. People think from birth one begins to live. <laughs> they think that life comes right. from birth, but no, life, one is eternal, one has an eternal soul. So all these things are wrong and, conclusions. And I'm growing, I'm growing. Yeah. Actually, I'm marching to a death. Yes, exactly. And these are all misconceptions. Yeah, and, and we would never be free of it unless we regularly hear Bhagavatam. We have to regularly hear it because you can hear it a thousand times and still forget. So, and still go back to that feeling that, you know, uh, from birth you begin to live. Actually, from birth you begin to die. But these verses of seven chapters became very powerful. Yes. This is really, this really like part of all the arguments Prabhupada said that verse, 714, is the solution to all the problems of life. Yeah. That's he says it's the solution to all the problems of life. That's a major major statement. <laughs> one is where just faith in that story. Huh? See, one is that faith in that statement. Yes. Yeah. For the problem solved. Karipo. Of course, the Prabhupada ki jai. Have you ever noticed that in the Isha Pranas? He's talking about the pacification of nature. It's unbelievable. I, I, I fell over the day I read that. I, be, I, I mean, I read it many times. It never hit me. You know, The day it hit me, like I'm, I almost 